Okay, so, good morning. My name is Janne Lindqvist and I'm with the Helsinki University of ne Technology in Finland and also with the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley, California. And the uh, title of the talk is IPv6 is bad for your privacy, but I can start saying that, well, it's not that bad after all, after all, when you have arrived to listen to this. So, uh, it's kind of, kind of silly saying that you could say that IPv4 is bad for your privacy or Internet is bad for your privacy, but you'll see what's my point. So, to introduce the topic, so I'm actually going to talk about how the IPv6 address itself can be used as a covered channel. And a covered channel is a mechanism that is not designed for communication, but can be used for that. So IPv6 address is designed for as an interface identifier for a host or uh, for routing purposes so to show the location of the host but it's not designed to communicate any other kind of information. And about covered channels in IP, so there is, uh, well, some related work already in this. So the, this, I gave this talk before in military communications conference in last year, and uh, last year DEF CON, uh, Murphy presented how to use ICMPv6 as a covered channel. So I have all, all, only read the abstract of that presentation, so I don't know the actual contents. But then in Privacy Enhanced Technologies Workshop, there was a paper in, about covered channels in IPv6, and the authors listed 22 different covered channels that are in IPv6 and uh, had some discussion about how to detect these covered channels. Then uh, in information hiding workshop, there's a paper about how you can embed covered channels in IPv4 and how to make this undetectable and how to uh, detect trivial covered channels. Then uh, in CCS, there's a paper about how to uh, do timing covered, covered channels. So uh, that's quite interesting because, uh, as you probably know, IP is not a reliable service, so it's not that trivial to uh, send timed IP packets so that the recipient actually can deduce what's the actual timing pattern. And there's one other pipe paper about uh, covered channels in IP that I'm aware of. But all these uh, other work uh, didn't point out this, uh, well, when I say it to you, it's rather obvious, obvious and simple covered channel. So an IPv6 address can be configured manually, just like in IPv4. And we can use in IPv6 networks DHCP v6, which is equivalent of the IPv4 DHCP. Or we can use the stateless address auto configuration, which is the source of this covered channel problem. So the IPv6 stateless address auto configuration is designed to auto-configurate unicast IPv6 addresses. So just a reminder that the IPv6 address basically consists of 64 bits of a sub subnet prefix and 64 bits of the interface, interface identifier which uh, marks the particular host. So the auto configuration can be used so that you don't have to manu manually configure or use DHCP v6. So the and you can acquire both link local that address that you use in the local area network and a global address with the help of uh, router advertisements. And the auto configuration procedure is quite simple. 
So a node chooses a tentative address candidate and then performs a duplicate address detection. So it sends this tentative address candidate to the network and if nobody replies to this te tentative candidate uh, address that the, the address is actually in use, the node, node starts to use the address. Or if somebody replies that, okay, I'm using the address, the node chooses another address and starts to use that if uh, first sends the duplicate address detection. If, if nobody replies to that, starts to use the address. And then there's a very well-known privacy issue with this IPv6 auto configuration mechanism that this has been addressed by the IETF. So by default, still in the uh, proposed or draft standard RFC, the interface identifier is derived from the MAC address of the network interface. And this creates pri privacy problems in the sense that the interface identifier would be the same in every network that you would attach your computer. So it could, it actually could be used to correlate all traffic that originates from the node and possibly the user of the, of the host. And this correlation can be performed by the attacker that is in the path of the communicating peers or has access to the logs of the peers. And the RFC 3041 proposes privacy extensions to the address auto configuration. So basically, the address can be chosen randomly instead of uh, using the MAC address derived version. So this is pretty obvious then. So since the interface identifier can be chosen randomly, it also contains useful information that can be used for an attack. So uh, 64 bits is actually quite a big cover channel. However, uh, we need to assume that the attacker ne can compromise the operating system, but uh, well, you probably all know well that how that can be done, so I don't need to go there. But okay, so as I mentioned, there's related work about these covered channels. So there are quite a few possibilities, but why is this different? Why? it's even mentioning, worth mentioning about. So the thing is that the IPv6 address is in every packet that you send to the well, IPv6 network. Uh, so for example, uh, you, you could use TCP sequence numbers as cover channels, but if you happen to use IP security ESP to protect your traffic, the outside attacker cannot see the TCP sequence number. Of course, there are possibilities for cover channels in the IP security too. And what I'm trying to say here is that since it's in every packet, so this is not that you uh, include in the packet. So IPv6, for example, has optional headers that you could include and use as a cover channels. So how do you detect you need to have this address in every packet that you send? And if you can choose it randomly, well, I'm saying that it's, there's actually no way to detect that somebody is using the cover channel on the network, if you're careful. You can, of course, uh, in the operating system do stuff to detect it, but not on the network. So exploits for these covered channels, covered channel are the, so the traditional two-party communication. So Alice talks to Bob and Bob talks to Alice. So if you were in DEF CON last year, I think you saw a demonstration about this. But then there are these, uh, third party attacks. So you can, for example, uh, transmit secrets uh, unknowingly of, for the user or do Big Brother surveillance. And 
Uh, I'll give an example of both of these attacks, but, and I'm emphasizing this point, that of course you can do this kind of attacks uh, in various ways. So for example, you could just open a connection to a server or uh, whatever, but that's not very covered, so that can be detect detected on the network, with, for example, if an uh, intrusion detection system perhaps. So for the first uh, possible exploit, uh, so in this scenario we need some way to identify the compromised devices. So this is kind of limited as you will see. So let's say that you have a laptop with the wireless LAN and you are using it. So the attacker has somebody somehow compromised it. Perhaps it's a malicious vendor or whatever, or if for, for a worm that spreads on the wireless interface or whatever. And he has a database of these devices that are compromised and the, the MAC addresses. So you use the MAC address of the wireless link to identify the devices. So then you just passively listen to the wireless traffic and check if there are compromised device nearby and then uh, for example the IP address uh, the 64 bits uh, excuse me <coughs> contains for example the IP security or TLS uh, session key so uh, encoded in some way. So this is uh, currently this can be done for example for triple this so 56 by oops 56 by uh, bit uh, desk but for example it, this will not be that feasible when, when uh, uh, advanced encryption standard will use uh, 128 bits by default or asymmetric crypto. So this uh, uh, sending the keying material with just this covered channel is not that uh, feasible in uh, the near future anymore. So when we are migrating to uh, symmetric crypto that use better keys. But it's still feasible today. But the uh, uh, Big Brother surveillance scenario, so this is more feasible. So I, I have just outlined the uh, straw man scenario for this. So you can think many other ways to uh, do, do this surveillance. So let's say that Big Brother has, uh, well it doesn't want that the users, well he, it wants to know that if the users uh, are accessing certain websites. So to the, the compromised operating system then uh, includes a list of the websites, the blacklist of the websites. And the web browsing is monitored by the operating system. And if the user happens to go to a website that, that is on the blacklist, uh, the operating system does the attack that follows. So the next time the computer is rebooted. So to em emphasize this, that this kind of surveillance attack doesn't need to be uh, that that timely. So the big brother can can wait that. Okay, well the user has gone to this kind of site. So next time uh, he reboots the computer, it starts to announce this. So the next time the computer is rebooted, the IPv6 stateless address auto configuration configures the address to a pre predefined bit pattern. And the address will seem random. And when the address is changed, uh, for example, if the user ha uses the privacy extension that way that it changes uh, change, uh, more often than the default, the, it just will put another pre configured bit pattern. And the device is thus marked, so everywhere the computer is now attached, the, it will send in the, all the IP packets that, okay, I have access to these websites. And of, of course we can see here that, okay, there's 
possibility that uh, by somebody a uh, accidentally, the, since the default way is to choose the address in random, so it's accidentally the pre-configured bit, bit pattern, but I guess the big brother can uh, sort these things out. But, and then, uh, now that I have described the attack, so how, how can we uh, mitigate this attack. So the ob obvious answer is that you do not use the stateless address auto configuration. Use the manual configuration or DHCP six. And actually, Tor would would help when it's uh, in IPv6. So if, if you use Tor, your address would be announced only in the uh, to, to the nearest Tor node. So not to the whole network that you browse or for example, IPv6 network address translation, if it will come. So well, one of the uh, things that have been said about IPv6 that, okay, we, there will be no network address translators, but uh, as far as the, it has been on the news, that so that uh, many companies would like to have the similar uh, things that are in IPv4 used. But uh, one efficient mitigation is actually this so-called cryptographically generated ad addresses, or CGA. So these are defined in RFC 3972, and these are mainly used for secure neighbor discovery. And in CGA, the interface identifier uh, is actually a hash of the subnet prefix public key, security parameter, and something else. And, uh, well, and this actually prevents pre-computation of a suitable hash so that you can have, a, have the pre-configured pre bit pattern because you, you, you actually cannot uh, pre-computate for every subnet prefix the hash pattern that you would like. So, if, it, if this uh, CTA was just uh, for the, uh, based on the public key, you could actually do, do it this way, that you just install uh, some public private key pairs that, that the, hash, the public key hashes to uh, the pre-configured pattern. But this way you cannot actually pre-compute. Uh, it's still possible, so if you have list, but list of these pre-configured bit patterns that you would like to has it has this, so you could you should, but it, it would need that you would need to create lots of public keys, so it's not that feasible anymore. So I don't have any much time anymore. So in conclusion, the point of this talk was that, okay, we actually have quite a few of these protocols today that try to protect the privacy of the user by introducing random uh, protocol identifiers. For example, session, I I identifier, uh, session initiation protocol SIP uh, has these privacy extensions and uh, I don't know, have you heard about HIP, but it has also this. But, so whenever we introduce these random protocol identifiers to protect the privacy of the user, we introduce also the po uh, possibility of covert channels that can be used by the Alice and Bob to communicate in uh, some with some other traffic or can be used to as by a third party to compromise the confidentiality of the communication or can be used to reveal any kind of information about the user the third parties and so in the end as I said the start so IPv6 is not that bad for your privacy uh, compared to IPv4 but the stateless address auto configuration the privacy extensions uh, uh, make possible to do other other kind of privacy attacks and uh, i was so 
the questions and answers are at room 108, but I think I have a couple of minutes still. So thank you.